Would you open your Bibles, please, to the very last chapter of the Bible, Revelation chapter 22. We're going to begin reading once again in verse 12, but we're actually going to be jumping in in verse 17. This is actually where we start today. But we have to, once again, grab it in the context in which it is. Jesus said, Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. Outside are the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. Here's Jesus' signature, which we talked about last week. He signs the letter. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root of and the offspring of David, the Messiah, the bright and morning star. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Revelation tells us, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. God called the dry land earth, And the gathering together of the waters he called seas. The book of Revelation tells us, and there was no sea anymore. The darkness he called night. There shall be no more darkness. There shall be no more night. God made two great lights. The greater to rule the day and the lesser to rule the night city of God, the new Jerusalem, has no need for the sun or the moon. And the Lord and Jesus the Lamp are its light. God declared to Adam and Eve about that maybe chocolate-covered fruit, the day you eat of it, you will surely die. Revelation tells us There shall be no more death. God said when he was pronouncing the curse, I will greatly increase your sorrow and pain. Revelation tells us there shall be no more pain. God, when he was pronouncing the curse, said cursed is the ground for your sake. Revelation tells us there shall be no more curse. Man was driven from the tree of life. Revelation tells us, now you can go up and eat from it. Man was driven from God's presence. Revelation tells us, and they shall see his face. Man's first home, Eden, was by a river. Man's eternal home, right next to God's river, that river of life. Verse 17, the Spirit and the bride say, come. Let him who hears say, come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come. And whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. That's God's invitation. This is the altar call. Except the altar is not the front of the church. The altar is the very throne of God himself. And this is the command that was inspired, first of all, by the Holy Spirit, who is also called the Spirit of Jesus. 
Who's talking? John. Or is it Jesus? Well, it's definitely him speaking through an angel to John. John is writing it down. This is Jesus' altar call. He says, pay attention. The Spirit and the Bride say, come. Who's being called here? The Spirit and the Bride say, come. The Spirit and the Bride say, The Spirit and the Bride say, Thank you, Bride. Who's being called? Who's being called to? Jesus? Could be. I am convinced from the entire context of the Bible itself, much less all the little individual references and books that are that contain references to Jesus' coming, to the Messiah's return. That he will come. It's very easy to intellectualize the Bible in our modern day and age, and even in medieval times, to say, oh, it's a spiritual coming. He's not really physically coming back. We're in the millennium now. Man, if this is the millennium, you can have it. Because it's not anything like the description of the Scriptures. When Jesus returns, it's going to be amazing. But greater than that, He is coming as a bride for bridegroom for His bride. And that's the way He sees us. That's the way He treats us. The Spirit and the bride say, come. Are they talking to Jesus? They might as well be. Because once again, as you read the entire Scripture and the yearning for the coming of the Messiah in the Old Testament, the coming of the Messiah in the New Testament and Him putting a yearning in us for His return, giving us the Holy Spirit as a deposit for His return, that He is coming. The bride says, come. The Spirit who indwells the bride says, come. I have a hard time relating to a person who claims to be a Christian and is not looking forward to the coming of Jesus Christ for his bride. There's something wrong there. And it makes me wonder if the person, though they declare themselves to be a Christian, really is or not. That's not up to me to judge, nor is it up to you. It's up to God. But his word draws some very, very serious lines here that we have to pay attention to. The Spirit and the Bride say, come. The Holy Spirit leads us, calls on us, speaks through us. Come, Lord Jesus. I want you to come. I need you to come. And if my heart is not there, maybe I'm too comfortable or happy with the world. Maybe I'm pursuing that as my goal in life and eternity. Doesn't work that way. Who is the Spirit and the Bride calling to? Well, perhaps to Jesus, but for sure, the lost, the desperate, the ignorant. They didn't know. Both. All of the above. The Holy Spirit of God. Also, the Spirit of Jesus, the Bible calls Him. The Spirit of prophecy, He's known as. Says, come. To where? Come. To what? We can just say, come, that's good enough. Wait a minute, that's an abstraction. These people didn't see it that way. The picture has just been drawn. It's been painted. It's been painted vividly. Come. This is more than just a come to Jesus moment. The bride says, come. Church, 
You're the bride. We cry out to the world. Come. We know our bridegroom. And like as it is in the book of Ephesians. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing with water through the word that he may present her to himself, a radiant bride without stain or blemish. But then Paul goes on to say, but I am talking about Christ and the church. And as we live and walk and breathe in this world as the church, a Christian that doesn't walk in holiness. And I know we all fall down in sin. If we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Yes, if we confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yes. But a Christian who doesn't want to walk in holiness in this world, a bride of Christ, I don't think they've ever seen the bridegroom. They don't know what a magnificent person he is. The bride is the holy bride of Christ. That in this world, like ancient brides and even modern Arab brides, the bride wears a veil while she's betrothed to the man she will eventually be living with as her husband. And the veil is our purity, folks. It is our purity. And the world is constantly saying, take that veil off. We want to see your face. Take that veil off. We want you to be like us. Take that veil off. You're a prude. You're religious. You're something else. Or the latest, which I think is just hilarious. You're an extremist. When it comes to the things of Jesus, I am extreme. Because I've seen Him. The bride, us, says come. To where? Not just to Jesus. To Jesus, that's the start. But to where He is, to His home, to eternity, to the new Jerusalem. To be with Him forever and ever and ever. To what? That great city which also retains the name that He gave you, the bride. That new Jerusalem. That enormous cube, 1,500 miles square, up, down, side, transparent gold shining from the inside, those pearly gates that are there. To whom? To God and to Jesus, who are the light in the middle of it. This day is coming. This is not an abstraction to these people. And it should never be to us. This is, yes, is there symbolic language being used? Yes, for something that is not symbolic at all. There will be this place. And we will be there. The bride knows. She knows. There is... And I, I'm kind of reluctant to talk about movies, but this one is worth it. Uh, from the pulpit, anyway. There was a movie that came out back in the early 60s, black and white, called The Miracle Worker. It was about Helen Keller. I think most, if not all of you, know who she was. She professed Christ when somebody explained to her who Jesus was, she says, oh, I've known him for a long time, just didn't know his name. However that worked, we don't know. But when she was an infant, she got sick and it made her blind and deaf, which is really a bad situation to be in. And while she was growing up, she was a holy terror around her house and around her parents because they didn't treat her properly in education so she became more of an animal until finally they brought the teacher Annie Sullivan who also had a vision problem but she became the teacher and she knew deaf language which I don't know 
and she was able to spell things in Helen Keller's hand, which she didn't understand. And this movie, which is very dramatic, but extremely well done, comes to a climactic moment where suddenly it's like everything clicked in Helen's head, where she was still this vicious little animal of a child, the way that she lived and acted and tantrumed and everything else. Suddenly, she understood water. And they were at a pump. And water was pumped out, and her teacher, Annie Sullivan, spelled out water, and the lights came on. She understood it. She was blind and deaf to the end of her life, but the lights came on. And the way it's portrayed in the movie, you know, it's just, ah, oh, it's gripping. It's, it's electrifying, especially for a black and white movie. And Annie Sullivan begins chasing her around as she begins to understand things. Everything she touches, a deck, a door, a, a, a water pump, she spells out in deaf language, in her hand, what it is. And she gets it. She gets it. And Annie Sullivan, the teacher, starts yelling to the family. And the family comes out. And the, as the family sees what's going on, they think it's chaos. And Annie Sullivan begins yelling, Mrs. Keller, Mrs. Keller. And then she just screams, she knows. You know. You're the bride. We know the bridegroom. The world doesn't know. In this world, yes, we're afflicted with a kind of blindness. Even as Christians, we don't see well. Paul said that over, remember, over in uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 13. That we see through a glass darkly. That's looking at a very dull reflection in a mirror. It doesn't make much sense, but we can see enough to maybe get by. But someday we'll see face to face, he tells us. The world has neither right now. We are the betrothed of Christ. <clears throat> and we say to the world, Come! We know. And we say to Christians who have wandered from the faith, wandered from the truth, or never even come to grips with it, they've just been raised in it somehow, or gone to church and come forward at an altar call, and now I've had my religious moment, my come to Jesus moment, and now it's back to real life. The call is, come. Why? Because we know. You know. We know our bridegroom. The bride knows. Knows knows that she, that he, rather, the bride, is coming. I'll get my pronouns correct here. The bride knows that he, our bridegroom, is going to take her to his father's house where they will be together forever. And we've spent ample time talking about this here. To the new Jerusalem, the bride where they, the bride, us, will live together in that unimaginable city with Jesus and his Father forever and ever and ever. So the invitation is put out. The Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him who hears say, Come. Come. It's in the invitation. And whoever is thirsty, let him come. Whoever is thirsty. You thirsty? Come. Yes, you gave your life to Christ, but 
You've never really been his. Jesus doesn't come along and say, shame on you. He comes to you and says, come! Quench your thirst with me. Come. Now. It's his personal invitation. Everyone gets thirsty. We all know what that's about. The question is, with life and eternity, where will you quench your thirst? With what? Or with whom? I want you to turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah chapter 55. I think Jesus is reminding us of this beautiful passage in Isaiah. It was God speaking anyway. Remember, Isaiah, as we talked about last week, like any real true prophet, is just a mouth. And here the mouth is speaking for God. And what does God say to his people? Verse 1. Come. There it is. Come. All you who are thirsty, just like Jesus, just like the book of Revelation, come to the waters. And you who have no money, you're broke, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Just come. I got nothing. Then come. Why spend your money on what is not bread? and your labor on what doesn't satisfy. Listen, he says. Listen to me, God says. He implores. Listen. And eat what is good, and your soul will delight in the richest fare. It's free. It's bought and paid for, and not by you or your works, or even your best goodness. It's bought and paid for by Jesus. Verse 3. Give ear and come to me. Hear me that your soul may live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. See, I have made him a witness to the peoples and a leader and, the, uh, leader and commander of the peoples. Surely you will summon nations you know not. Come! And nations you do not know will hasten to you. Come! Because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, For he has endowed you with rags, nakedness, splendor. A word we don't use nearly often enough. And when we use it, we talk about the Lord. When God uses it, he talks here about you, us. Verse 6. Invitation. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near, because there will come a day when that door will close. Verse 7. Let the wicked forsake his way. What are the qualifications? Here you go. And the evil man, his thoughts. It's called repentance. That must be taught. That must be preached in the church. It must continually be preached in the church because God does not ever sanction sin. He doesn't wink at it. He sent His Son to the cross to die for your sins, my sins, the sin of the world because it's bad. It kills. It keeps people from God. That is not His will. Let Him turn to the Lord and He will have mercy on Him and to our God and He will freely pardon sins. Verse 8. Oh, I love this. God speaking. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways. Hey, I can't figure this out. How do I make this happen? Uh, How does he do it? (laughs) My thoughts are not your thoughts, he said. Neither are my ways your ways. In other words, look, I just did it, okay? Come. As high as the... Heavens are higher than the earth. 
So are my ways than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. We know. He spoke. He said. We know. He says, come. And all His authority and His perfection is behind it. And when it goes out, His Word... His gospel, His truth, His message in any form that it is His message. It will accomplish what He wants. If only people would grab onto it. What's the fruit? Verse 12. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. Something that people didn't have much of in those days. The mountains and the hills will burst into song before you and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. I know, hyperbole. But it really expresses the joy that all nature, as Paul said, groans now for the coming and the return of Jesus. And that's just stupid nature. We know. Verse 13. Instead of the thorn brush, will grow the pine tree. And instead of briars, the myrtle will grow. This will be for the Lord's renown, an everlasting sign which will not be destroyed. Let him who hears say, Come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come. And whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life, back in Revelation chapter 22. John, the same John that wrote Revelation, if you have any doubts, observed and wrote this for us over in his gospel. Chapter 7, verse 37 through 39. John 7, 37 through 39. On the last and greatest day of the feast, something happened that is not recorded in the scriptures. However, it is recorded by people who recorded the traditions of the Jews at this period of time. Where on the last great day of the feast, Sukkot, when the celebration of a week-long feast, which is the high point of joy for the Jews during their, their festive year, one of the priests would take a golden pitcher and run about 400 vertical feet and about a half mile down to the bottom of the old city of David from the Temple Mount. Scoop up out of a mikveh down there, which is, of course, a pool where water flows in and water flows out, so the water is considered very pure. Also known, if you're a student of the Bible, John chapter 11, the Pool of Siloam. So, John chapter 11, no, I got the wrong chapter. Anyway, 9, there you go. He scoops it up, and then he, this, boy, these guys were in good shape in those days. He hoofs it back up that 400 vertical feet, half mile up to the Temple Mount, gets up on a platform, and pours that pitcher out, and all the people rejoice because God gives them living water, water from the rock. They're commemorating their wanderings in the wilderness how God gave them food and kept them alive, and now how God split that rock open on two different occasions and gave them enough water to water a million, two million people, plus their animals. This isn't just a little stream. We're talking about something more like the American River at flood stage, coming out for that many people and that many animals. And it was pure, ready to drink, and good from God. And he pours the pitcher out, and then there in the water storage areas on the Temple Mount, they're 
burst open and the whole place floods with pure water at that time, washing out the temple, cleansing it, but also proclaiming it's God who cleanses and it's God who gives that water of life, which even then they were looking forward to. And at that moment, Jesus climbs up on a platform of some sort there and shouts, If anyone is thirsty, anyone, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams or torrents, literally, of living water will flow from within him. And by this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. We got a taste of living water now, but there's something else coming. And it will be in that new Jerusalem, and it will be the river of the water of life and he says, if you're thirsty, if you're lost, if you wish, just if you want it, come. Because again, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, all. And in this case, how much is all? Spurgeon said this. I really like it. People can come up with excuses about all of this. And Spurgeon knew it, if you don't know who he is. He's a Victorian-era British preacher. Amazing guy. <clears throat> he submits a rhetorical question, actually a series of them, and here's what he said. Speaking for somebody who might be wondering about all of this, I don't understand all the Christian doctrine and theology. The response? Come anyway, because it doesn't say whoever understands. Let him take the water of life freely. Well, I can't repent the way I should. My heart is hard, and I can't even weep over my sins or feel bad over them as I should. Come anyway, because it doesn't say whoever feels, let him take the water of life freely. Well, I don't know if I could live that Christian life the way that I should. Come anyway, because it doesn't say whoever can, let him come and take the water of life freely. Well, I don't know if I'm worthy to live the Christian life. Come anyway, because it doesn't say whoever is worthy, let him take the water of life freely. But then he adds this, but mark this, sinner. It says, whosoever. What a big word that is. Whosoever. There is no standard height here. It is of any height and any size, little sinners, big sinners, black sinners, white sinners, old sinners, aggravated sinners, sinners who have committed every crime in the catalog, whosoever, let him... You got your line right. Look at verse 18. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, woe, Shift gears, why don't you? I warn everyone, suddenly you've got this huge invitation, but now there's a warning. <coughs> Excuse me. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. You listening to the book? You reading the book? The book being read to you? Pay attention to this. If anyone adds anything to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. If anyone takes words away from this book of prophecy, prophecy, God speaking, God will take him, take away rather, from him his share in the tree of life and the holy city, which are described in this book. Folks, it is a warning. There's another word for it in ancient thinking that is also known as a curse. A blessing is a blessing only because it's something that God can do. Through you, through another person, but it's from Him. Otherwise, it's an achievement. It's a good thing that I did. 
A blessing has got supernatural origins, and it comes from God. Now, back in the old days, and even in parts of the world today and throughout history, people like to pronounce curses on other people or situations. But truly, you have no power to do that. Only God can. And so God is saying, I want you to remember, don't mess with this message. And it rings of something else. Deuteronomy. Laws of Moses. Chapter 4, verse 1. The prophet Moses. Hear now, O Israel, the decrees and laws I am about to teach you. Follow them. Hear them. Follow them. So that you may live and you may go in and take possession of the land that the Lord, your, the God of your fathers, is giving you. And then he said this, Do not add to what I command you, and do not subtract from it, but keep the commands of the Lord that I give you. Now this passage that we just read here, God's warning. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, don't add to them, don't take away from them, or bad things will happen. We can say that applies to the whole Scripture, and I believe in principle it does. But this curse at the end of the book is something that was common in the sight of the people back then, and even by Moses saying, don't mess with God's Word. The laws of Moses. His book. It kind of is a closed parenthesis on what Moses started when he said this. But he says, don't mess with it. Because it is a curse. When you go to places in the ancient world, especially the ancient Greek and Roman world, and you go visit what's called a necropolis, our term, cemetery. <clears throat> they look a lot different than ours do today. But they would have tombs that, in many cases, were either carved into a hillside rock or built, perhaps, and it looks like a little house or whatever, or a mound, but there was always a stone placard, well, almost always, that was placed over a tomb of a rich person because they were often buried in really nice clothes and people just didn't have a lot of clothes back then. You don't go down to the boutique and buy one. The clothes you're wearing may be the only set of clothes you ever have. That's the way life was back then. So you've got a dead person buried in nice clothes. What are you going to do? Well, they're not going to need them. So you break into the tomb and you take it. Or maybe they're buried with valuables of some sort. Things made out of metal. Metal was always precious no matter what it was. Gold all the way down to bronze. But you're going to take it. So to make sure nobody got into the tombs, and like any thief, if they want to get into something, they will, you find these placards in these strange languages over the top of the entrance to the tomb. And you think, oh, that must be the name of the family. It's not. It's a curse. That if they can read it, it says that if you break into this tomb, you're going to have an early transmission failure on the 80 at 5 o'clock on Friday. <laughs> or something worse. So it was to protect the tombs because people believed in curses. People believed in curses for other reasons. Remember, Jesus commanded his church, do not curse, bless, and do not curse. Those, both of those are in the hands of God. God has created us to bless others, not to curse them. He'll take care of the curse. His whole message here, don't tamper with the book. It's words and it's message, especially Revelation, where this verse resides. You just read it. It's in your hand. Are clear. The message is clear, or it wouldn't warn you not to tamper with it. The message of Revelation is understood. It's clear. Don't tamper with it. And if you do, if you add anything, God will add the plagues described in this book. Listen. Listen. The plagues described in this book, in other words, are not for those who listen to it and believe it as it is. 
if you ever wanted proof of a rapture before all hell breaks loose on the earth, you just got it right there. Because it's either or. You mess with the book, you add to this book, those plagues will be added to you. In other words, not now, but don't mess with it, or they will. Which means you're not going through the tribulation. Bride, church, those who thirst, those who call out to the Lord, you're not going through that. Mess with the book, here it comes. The plagues of this book are not for those who listen and believe it as it is. Do you believe the book of Revelation? Then you're exempt. You're not destined unto wrath. You're not destined to experience the judgment and wrath that will come upon this world when it comes. Heaven is freely given to you and not the lake of fire. This is a terrifying curse. Oh, the name being taken out of the book of life, we've already talked about that a few times, and I'm not trying to avoid anything. You can go back and listen to several different studies where we've actually attacked that one. It doesn't mean what you think it might mean. It means that as far as God is concerned, you take things out of this book, you're dead to me. And that's the way they thought of it. When you were born, your name was written into a scroll in any major city. And when you died, your name was stricken from the scroll. So it doesn't have the same connotations as the Lamb's Book of Life. It's different. Lamb's Book of Life says your name will never be taken out. <clears throat> but as far as God is concerned, you mess with the things that I tell you not to mess with. You're just proving you're already dead. Your name's not in that book. It's a terrifying curse. But specifically to whom? Who is this curse written to? Well, those who do that. Now, that's an abstraction. Once again, these people would have something very specific in mind. It's clear who this is written to. The recipients of Revelation. It's a letter, remember? Remember? And who is the letter written to? From Jesus, dictated to John. The seven churches. Doesn't mean it doesn't apply to us. Of course it does. In principle, it absolutely does. But in those seven churches, at least in five of them, there were opposition parties. People there that had said, yes, we take Jesus as our Messiah, plus a little paganism here, a little pagan practice there, a little denial of this here, a little exaggeration of that there, a little laziness here where we're just going to set the whole thing aside and call us Christians because it's really cool, or because, well, I want my life insurance, my eternal life insurance. Revelation is, this is bad grammar, but you'll see what I'm doing with it. Revelation is the words of Jesus, the whole thing. And he, Messiah, Lord, and God, abhors, abhors and personally curses any improvements, additions, suggestions, or editing, especially when they come from within Jesus' own church and claim his authority to alter them. I was questioning whether I was going to say this or not. I'm going to. There was a guy who walked in this morning who had a special message for me to give to you that he knows exactly when Jesus is coming back, never mind the fact that Jesus said he doesn't. And these people pop up and happen usually around eclipses. They are superstitious. They are adding to the Word of God, and God help them. They are in big, big trouble. And if you believe you know when Jesus Christ is coming back, you need to repent now lest these plagues be added to you. Because they will be, not might be. You can tell I get tired of people telling me when Jesus is coming back, when I believe Jesus, when he said, I don't even know, you won't. I can get along with that just fine. John Walvoord, the great chancellor of Dallas Theological Seminary and commentator, said, how great will be the judgment of those who despise this book and relegate it to the mystical experiences of an old man, thereby denying 
that it is the inspired Word of God. Rejecting the Word of God is rejecting God Himself. Verse 20. He who testifies to these things says, come. Says, yes, I am coming soon. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Who's speaking? (laughs) Yes, I'm coming soon. Jesus. You got a red letter Bible? Right there. Yes, I'm coming soon. Yes and amen, I am coming soon. The commission here, I will be that comfort. I'm your bridegroom, you're my bride. The world is a mess. And in the end, it's going to come under the wrath with a capital W. But for you, church, to whom this is written, I'm coming soon. Quickly, when he comes like lightning from the east to the west. Well, it's been a couple of thousand years, that's not exactly soon. Remember, as Peter said to the Lord, a thousand years is as a day, and a day is a thousand years, so he's only been gone a couple of days. I'm coming soon. Be at rest. In your hearts, you're safe. In Him. Unless you're not. Which we've gone over. Watch. Be ready. Like a bride waiting for her bridegroom. Matthew 24 and 25. Like a faithful servant waiting for the master to return. Being about his business now while you have the time to do it. Until he returns. Matthew 24. Because. I don't know. I'm not predicting anything, but I'm looking at the way this world is going. And whatever it's done in the past, it's going a lot faster now. John's closing prayer. Amen. So be it. Come, Lord Jesus. In the Greek, it says one thing. But I like the the Aramaic equivalent, which is Maranatha. Maranatha. So I want to read you two things. Hear from this stable. Hear from this Nazareth. This stony beach, this Jerusalem. This marketplace, this garden. This praetorium this cross, this mountain, I announce it to you. I announce to you what is guessed at in all the phenomena of the world. You see the corn of wheat shrivel and break open and die, but you expect a crop. I tell you of the springtime of which all springtime speak. I tell you of the world for which this world groans and toward which it strains. I tell you that beyond the awful borders imposed by time and space and contingency, there lies what you seek. I announce to you life instead of mere existence, freedom instead of frustration, justice instead of compensation. For I announce to you Redemption. Behold, I make all things new. Behold, I do what cannot be done. I restore the years that the locusts and the worms have eaten. I restore the years that you have drooped away on your crutches and in your wheelchair. I restore the symphonies and operas which your deaf ears have never heard and the snowy mass of your blind eyes have never seen and the freedom lost to you through plunder, and the identity lost to you because of slander, and the failure of justice, 
and I restore the good which your own foolish mistakes have cheated you of. And I bring to you the love of which all other loves speak, the love which is joy and beauty and which you have sought in a thousand streets and for which you have wept and clawed your pillow. That's not from the Bible, but it's from a man who I think so beautifully put into words the attitude of Jesus towards the people he wants to redeem, which is everyone. This is the come to Jesus moment. And John finishes in verse 21 by saying, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. And here we sit. And his last word is, Amen. Isaiah 44, verse 6 through 8. This is a good way to cap off this book. Isaiah 44, verse 6. This is what the Lord says. Israel's King and Redeemer, Yahweh Almighty. I am the first and I am the last. Apart from me there is no God. Who then is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and lay out before me what has happened since I established my ancient people and what is yet to come. Yes, let him foretell what is yet to come. Do not tremble. Do not be afraid. Did I not proclaim this and foretell it long ago? You are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? No, there is no other rock. No, not one. That's the end of the Bible. And yet that last passage just caps the whole thing off. Not adding to it, but showing where a lot of it came from. Now with that, we are going to recap the seven churches. Not in depth like we did, but we'll take a couple of weeks and go through those. I'll show you what they were like and what they're like today. And this will be coming up. And we're also going to do a Revelation recap, which we can do in one week, from chapter 1 to chapter 22. Just to give you the overview, here's what this book is about. I know you heard this before, but it's been two years. Now you've heard the whole book. What will you hear this time, now that you heard the book?